In the U.S., once war was declared, virtually overnight, car production was banned, and those assembly lines retooled to build planes, while other factories turned to making tanks, guns, and equipment. At the height of World War II, the United Kingdom needed more than one million tons of goods a week in order to survive and fight. The island nation was forced to import most of its goods by ship across the Atlantic. Day after day, week after week, the convoys go through, bringing food, supplies, ammunition, equipment to England. The Battle of the Atlantic was essentially a tonnage war. The Nazis' goal was to destroy as many tons of supplies as possible, and to do so long before they reached Europe. And so, with deadly efficiency, Commander of Submarines, Commodore Karl Dönitz, soon to be named Grand Admiral and Commander-in-Chief of the German Navy, unleashed his U-boat fleet on unprotected merchant ships. The shortest course to Europe lies across the North Atlantic. Concentrated here is the flow of Allied ships and enemy submarines. Dernitz's plan for the Atlantic was based on his belief that he could effectively cut off supply lines to the Allies, both by sending cargo to the ocean floor and destroying the ships needed to carry it. What neither he nor Hitler anticipated was America's ability to manufacture replacement vessels. Even before war was declared and U-boats were picking ships off at will, America was able to manufacture more ships than the Germans were sinking. We face the future with confidence and with courage. We are America. Having retrofitted production lines of all types to produce military equipment instead of cars, appliances, home goods and the like, the Allies were never really short of gear and supplies, nor the ships to transport them. American women also rose to the occasion. An absence of men serving in the military or shifted to employment in war production industries allowed women to fill many job vacancies. The percentage of American women working outside the home increased from 25% before the war to 36% during it. And they filled all jobs of all types. In the U.S. shipbuilding industry, for example, where women had previously been excluded from all but a few office jobs, women made up to one of 10 members of the workforce during the war. And it was an underestimation of America's production capabilities that turned out to be the fundamental flaw in the Nazis' Atlantic strategy. 50%, I would say, of the employees at the shipyard when I worked here first in 1943-44 were w women. And when they first started, all they allowed them to do was paint, but by the time the end of the war, they were doing every trade on the shipyard, and they could do most of any job, welding, or electrical, and so forth, machinists, riggers, you name it. Women also made major contributions as part of the military. Army women, wax, had served in every theater of operations, and there was a handful of Coast Guard women who served in Alaska. Women's Auxiliary Ferry Squadron, or WAFs, was a small group of female pilots formed in 1942. WAFs were soon folded into a larger group known as the WASPs, Women Air Force Service Pilots, in 1943. Because of a war-related shortage of pilots, female flyers performed the important duty of ferrying aircraft from production facilities, mostly in the Midwest, to the coasts as well as overseas for delivery to military bases in Europe. The Marine Women's Corps was established in 1942 to provide qualified service women for duty at Marine Corps shore establishments releasing men for combat duty. The Women's Reserve of the Coast Guard, known as SPARS, Semper Paratus Always Ready, named after the Guard's official motto. They were created around the same time to provide assistance to the Guard. My job was to train the men to be photographers, to be able to process their film and send it back so the, the, the photographs that they took could be used either in the newspapers, magazines, or in the archives. Whatever they had to learn, that was my job to teach them and to stay alive with the camera and the gun on their back. Stay alive and get the pictures. I, when I photographed um, President Truman, I was very excited about photographing him. That was one of my favorite photographs. I think the most memorable photographs were when it was time to go home. 
When all of our men were going home, our, our, our admirals, our captains, everyone, when I would go aboard a troop ship, when we'd come in the harbor, I'd go aboard and I'd photograph those men on that ship. And they, they were crying, they were so happy when they passed that Statue of Liberty. All you could see were the tears and the happiness of those men that were coming home. And those are the photographs that I like the most. The Navy's acronym for their female troops was WAVES, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. Created in 1942 in response to the need for additional military personnel, members of the WAVES held the same rank, ratings, and pay as male personnel. At the end of World War II, there were well over 8,000 female officers and some 10 times as many enlisted personnel. Additionally, nearly 10,000 brave women performed traditional roles as nurses, but did so closer to the front lines than ever before. It was not uncommon to find them working alongside men under fire in field and evacuation hospitals, on hospital trains and ships, and as flight nurses on medical transport planes. I think the most valuable contribution of women overseas during the war, without question, was that of the nurse corps particularly the Army Nurse Corps. They were out there toward the front lines. And, and you know, they didn't come home with lots of medals. They didn't get bronze stars. They didn't get commendation medals. They didn't get those kind of things. And yet their, their contribution toward taking care of the wounded was incredible, just incredible. A vast number of women were also involved in Britain. The Land Army actually had two branches. There was the Agricultural Branch and the Women's Forestry Service, as it was known in 1917. It was later to become the Women's Timber Corps. So successful was the Land Army and the Timber Corps during the First World War that when it became obvious that we were entering a Second World War, that they, the Women's Land Army was reformed again, actually in June 1939, which was three months before the outbreak of war for Great Britain. There were 80,000 land girls in the UK, 4,000 lumber gills, and more than 250,000 in the military services. The spirit was amazing. Everybody was happy and uh, it was as if there was no war because we were well out of it. We were all out up in the country uh, doing our own thing, felling trees and driving down to stations and coming back. Um, so it was good for us, very good. The spirit was great. Many thousands more took civilian support jobs. Um, so I loved working with horses and did a lot of the work in the winter, foddering the animals that all had to be fed, they were outwintered, um, working in the stable, <coughs> working, harrowing, things like that. I also loved working with the shepherd who was a particularly fine man. And we used to spend a whole day, perhaps, out at the sort of far end of the farm, dipping sheep or dozing sheep or doing something with sheep. And I found that kind of work, I never watched the time. It was just fascinating. And you suddenly found it was dinner time, time to stop. Uh, but I think the other thing that to me has been tremendously important is this respect for people in their own right, uh, irrespective of class background, anything else. Um, I just meet people as people. But in 1942, Rosie the Riveter was born in a popular song inspired by well-to-do Rosalind Walter, who was building fighter planes on the night shift in a Long Island factory. Rosie, the Riveter, Rosie, 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 working on assembly line. Other Rosies appeared, including Rosie Hickey, who, with her teammate, famously shot 3,300 rivets in one shift in an Avenger plane. There was the popular image of Rosie the Riveter and this famous song that was written that was heard repeatedly where she would be riveting a plane that would be in theater at a certain point. It was difficult, like in the military, to conduct any real business without in interacting a female because females were readily available. So yes, they were in the factories building ships and airplanes. They were working with munitions. Um, they would be working um, in, in various capacities uh, to support this war effort. By 1943, Norman Rockwell had put Rosie on a widely distributed magazine cover. An employer's estimates of jobs women would find acceptable had risen from 29 to 85 percent. 
Norman Rockwell's iconic painting of Rosie the Riveter helped to recruit more than two million women into the workforce. Many felt that after things were all over, women had played an important role in helping to win the war, and that they had certainly proved to men, as well as themselves, that they could do the job. Mm -hmm.